On a quiet field in the American South, the government once believed it was doing the right thing for nature, releasing millions of tiny creatures from South America into the soil to save the crops, restore ecological balance, and end the age of toxic chemicals. But humanity has never truly mastered nature. Those allies soon seized territory, attacked people, disrupted infrastructure, and turned our very own backyards into battlefields. What began as a bold, celebrated no. idea has now left America facing an invader it brought upon itself. How did a decision meant to save nature unleash an entirely new fight for survival? How do we correct a mistake of this scale? And can we even fix it anymore? Let's find out. Before millions of small creatures from South America were brought into the United States with the promise of restoring nature's balance, we need to pause and rewind. Go back to a time when the American South had never heard the name Solenopsis Invicta, and see the picture that people themselves had painted a landscape quietly collapsing under the weight of pests, chemicals, and their own well-intentioned decisions. In the years after World War II, America entered an era the federal government proudly called the Green Revolution, a nationwide push to maximize food production after the war. Billions of dollars poured into programs to improve soil, expand farmland, subsidize pesticides, and most significantly, promote large-scale monoculture. For politicians in Washington, this was the way for America to become the breadbasket of the world. But for farmers in Alabama or Georgia, it was the beginning of an ecological imbalance unlike anything they had seen before, as millions of acres were cleared to grow corn, cotton, and peanuts on an industrial scale, native grasses vanished, natural food chains were severed, and the predators that once kept pests under control lost their habitat. In this stripped-down, uniform environment, pests exploded. Aphids devoured entire fields in a matter of weeks. Rootworms spread so quickly that corn yields in some Mississippi counties dropped by more than 35% in less than a decade. The government, instead of stepping back to assess the consequences, only poured more fuel on the fire. Massive new chemical subsidy programs rolled out, pesticides were distributed to farmers almost for free, and televised campaigns repeated the message that technological solutions were the key to the future. A 1,954 report from the Department of Agriculture even boasted that yields per acre have nearly doubled since the war, yet no one mentioned that the soil had lost nearly all its ability to regulate itself. For farmers, the changes looked very different. On the outskirts of Montgomery, families who had lived comfortably for three generations now had to take on debt just to afford pesticides. Many sprayed so heavily that the water from their wells reeked of chemicals, while the pests still returned every season, stronger and more resistant. In the cotton plains of Texas, Bees vanished from the fields, leaving pollination entirely dependent on human labor. And in Florida, once vibrant landscapes turned into dead zones where no beneficial insects survived. The economic and social fallout spread as well. Hundreds of farms went bankrupt, and many once thriving agricultural towns became ghostly and empty. Farmers abandoned their ancestral land to seek work in northern factories. Those who stayed lived under constant fear. A single unexpected pest outbreak could wipe out everything they owned. Federal scientists were not blind to what was happening. Many internal reports from the 1,950 warned that the current agricultural model is creating an artificial ecosystem entirely dependent on chemicals. But those warnings were ignored partly because of political pressure and partly because agriculture was the backbone of the American economy. No one wanted to be the first to admit that the path they were on might be the wrong one. And so, when the imbalance reached its peak, when chemicals no longer worked, and nature had lost its ability to heal itself, a question began to surface. Was there another way? A solution that didn't rely on chemicals, didn't destroy the environment, and could still protect the livelihoods of millions? In that atmosphere of desperation, an idea that sounded too good to be wrong began to take shape. If nature had once known how to balance itself, maybe all humanity needed to do was return one missing piece, and everything would fall back into order. And that's when a plan was born, a plan officials believed would fix nature with nature itself. No one knew that from that moment on, America had stepped into a spiral it would never again be able to control. Inside brightly lit federal agricultural research labs in the late 1950, a new belief was taking shape, one so powerful that many saw it as the last way out. The belief that if nature once knew how to balance itself, then humans could make it happen faster and more completely. The idea was called biocontrol, biological control, using natural predators to eliminate pests instead of relying on chemicals. It wasn't a far-fetched theory. 
the United States had already seen success releasing European ladybugs in California to control citrus aphids, and importing parasitic wasps from Asia to fight sugarcane borers in Hawaii. These victories became proof that nature itself could serve as a kind of biological weapon in human hands. Amid that optimism, one tiny species captured scientists' attention, the red imported fire ant, Solenopsis invicta, native to South America. To many researchers, it seemed like the perfect soldier. Unlike most ants, fire ants have an exceptionally organized social structure. A single colony can have multiple reproductive queens, allowing their numbers to grow at astonishing speed. Under ideal conditions, one mound can host up to 200,000 ants and produce countless new colonies within just a few months. They also possess a fearsome biological weapon, a stinger that injects alkaloid venom. This venom not only causes intense burning pain in larger animals, but also paralyzes and kills smaller insects from caterpillars and aphids to agricultural pests. When prey is detected, hundreds of ants swarm, bite, and inject venom simultaneously, killing their target within minutes. Fire ants are highly versatile feeders, too. They attack pests both above ground and below the roots, eliminating leaf-eating larvae as well as soil-dwelling insects. They aggressively defend their foraging territory, often driving out native ant species entirely. It was these traits that led many scientists to believe fire ants could serve as a living defense system, protecting plant roots, eliminating harmful insects, and safeguarding crops more effectively than any chemical pesticide. Early field trials in southern Texas appeared promising. Reports showed pest populations dropping significantly in some areas, by as much as 70% within just two growing seasons. Crops like cotton and peanuts grew healthier and required far fewer chemical treatments. Some farmers even said the soil felt alive again, with plants no longer dying off en masse as they had before. Researchers described fire ants as invisible sentinels. Unlike pesticides, which had to be purchased and applied on schedule, fire ants reproduced on their own, hunted continuously, and required no ongoing maintenance. In theory, once the ants were released, farmers would have a permanent biological protection system. The government quickly embraced the plan. Officials saw it as a dual breakthrough, reducing dependence on chemicals and the public health debates surrounding them while rescuing the collapsing agriculture of the American South. In congressional hearings, biocontrol was hailed as the second green revolution. The media called it a biological miracle. And so, from quiet laboratories, millions of fire ants began their journey into the wild. They were released first into experimental fields, then across southern states, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi. Officials believe they had found the perfect ally, a tiny, tireless army that cost nothing and could do what chemicals could not. But there was one reality almost no one mentioned. In their native South America, fire ants were kept in check by natural enemies, birds, spiders, parasitic fungi, and stronger native ants. In the United States, all those controls vanished. No predator could slow their reproduction, no disease spread quickly enough to limit their numbers, and no ecological barrier existed to keep them confined to test sites. In other words, humans had created an army with no enemy. At the time, though, no one worried. On paper, everything looked perfect. What they didn't know was that nature never follows the script humans write for it. To scientists, the fire ant was proof of human ingenuity, proof that we could turn nature into a tool to serve us. But only a few years later, that tool would change roles, becoming a force no one could control. At first, the signs from southern fields seemed to confirm every prediction. Pest numbers fell, yields rose, and chemical pesticides were slowly phased out. Newspapers even called fire ants the invisible army of American agriculture. But nature has a stubborn habit, it refuses to follow human plans. Just a few years after the biocontrol program expanded, strange signs began to emerge, so small at first that they were easy to ignore. A 1,967 report from Alabama noted that fire ant populations in test fields were four times higher than projected. In a Houston suburb, residents reported mysterious mounds along walkways, later identified as massive colonies, each containing hundreds of thousands of ants. Native ant species had almost vanished, and the intricate insect networks that once maintained ecological balance were gone. It wasn't until the problem spread beyond farms and into communities that people realized they had unleashed a force that could not be recalled. Fire ants began invading urban spaces, yards, parks, subway tunnels, even homes. They crawled into transformers and electrical boxes, causing widespread power outages. 
Texas alone was spending more than $140 million a year just to repair infrastructure damaged by ants. Hundreds of schools reported children being stung while playing outside, with many requiring hospitalization for severe allergic reactions. For livestock and pets, the consequences were even worse. On Florida farms, newborn calves and piglets were attacked within minutes of birth ants, swarming their mouths and eyes, injecting venom that killed them in moments. A study from Texas A and M University estimated that fire ants caused over $1 billion in annual losses to the livestock industry, and it had all started with a plan that once seemed perfectly safe. What made fire ants more terrifying than almost any other invasive species wasn't just their numbers, it was their extraordinary adaptability. Built taller mounds to survive floods, floated in rafts when water levels rose, and even formed ant bridges to cross obstacles and expand their range. Within three decades, they had spread far beyond their original test zones, reaching more than 14 states and occupying over 350 million acres from Texas to Virginia. And with their spread came transformation. In their new environment, fire ants developed behaviors far more aggressive than anyone had anticipated. They didn't just hunt pests, they wiped out beneficial insects like pollinating bees and parasitic wasps, critical links in the agricultural food web. In parts of Louisiana, the loss of bees caused fruit crop yields to drop by nearly 20%. A solution once meant to save the ecosystem was now destroying its foundation. Then came the most alarming shift of all. Fire ants began attacking humans. In Texas and Georgia, Thousands of emergency room visits each year were linked to fire ant stings. Their venom, a potent alkaloid cocktail, could trigger severe allergic reactions, from painful swelling and blistering to life-threatening anaphylaxis. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, estimates that around 80 people in the United States have died from fire ant venom reactions since their arrival. The danger wasn't just in their venom. Their extreme defensive instincts meant they saw any vibration as a threat. They attacked children playing in backyards, pets napping near nests, even elderly people resting on park benches. The creatures once praised as biological allies had become daily hazards in human life. By the late 1980, all illusions had collapsed. Studies showed that fire ants had not only failed to provide long-term pest control, but had also created ecosystems entirely dependent on them. With competing species wiped out, pests sometimes returned stronger than before, now unchecked by other natural predators. What was designed as a biological shield had become a closed loop of dependence, where the very species introduced now controlled the land, the crops, and the environment itself. And like a spiral, every human attempt to control them through chemicals, poisoned bait, or new biological enemies only threw the ecosystem further out of balance. A problem that once seemed small had grown into a national threat, and no one dared to claim they could solve it. Today, the question is no longer, are fire ants effective? It is, can America live with what it released? Every solution is costly, risky, and carries the potential to spark yet another chain of mistakes. And this is only the beginning of the spiral nature is preparing to unleash. For many years, fire ants were seen only as an agricultural issue, something that existed far away in the fields. But then, one day, the problem crossed the fence line. It crawled into backyards, slipped into parks and schools, and settled beneath the floors of millions of American homes. From that moment, an ecological battle turned into a fight woven into daily life. At first, hospital visits were rare and scattered. A young boy in Houston was stung dozens of times while sitting on the grass. A man in Georgia went into anaphylactic shock after stepping on a mound. A woman in Florida nearly died while gardening, but the numbers quickly surged. According to the CDC, more than 200,000 Americans are treated in emergency rooms every year due to fire ant stings. Thousands suffer severe allergic reactions, and about 70 to 80 people die, most from anaphylaxis. The danger lies not just in the alkaloid venom that can cause burning pain, swelling, and tissue necrosis, but in the way fire ants attack. When their mound is disturbed, hundreds of ants swarm out within seconds, clinging to skin and injecting venom all at once. An adult can suffer hundreds of stings in just a few minutes. For children, the elderly, or those with allergies, every minute can be the difference between life and death. Pets have not escaped the nightmare either. Newborn calves and piglets are attacked moments after birth. Dogs and cats have gone blind from stings around their eyes. For many families, walking the dog or letting children play outside has become a decision that requires serious thought. Alongside the medical crisis came a quieter but deeper shift in everyday life. In the suburbs of Dallas, mounds nearly a foot tall appeared overnight, turning playgrounds into minefields. 
In Houston, schools were forced to close because ant colonies spread across their grounds. Many local governments issued summer warnings urging residents to inspect their yards daily and limit outdoor activities. They weren't just outside. Fire ants crawled along power lines, nesting inside electrical boxes and causing shorts and outages. A study from Texas A&M University found that fire ants are responsible for roughly 15% of residential electrical failures in the southern United States. Some cities even reported fire alarm malfunctions and air conditioning breakdowns all traced back to ant colonies no one knew existed. These seemingly small changes are reshaping daily routines. Families have abandoned backyard dinners. Children no longer play in parks. Even sitting on a bench with a book has become a risk if you don't watch the ground beneath your feet. Bit by bit, what scientists once called a biological ally has become a threat in every moment of American life. And when the enemy is no longer out there, but lurking beneath our feet, the question becomes, how much control do we truly have left? Once fire ants were no longer a biological experiment, but part of daily life, governments and scientists were forced to fight back. But the counterattack looked more like a gamble than a strategy because every move risked creating a new mistake. The first thing humans did was return to what they had once tried to avoid, pesticides. Widespread chemical spraying campaigns were launched across Texas, Florida, and Louisiana in the hope of weakening fire ant populations. The results were the opposite. The ants quickly developed resistance, surviving doses once powerful enough to kill most insects. Worse still, the mass spraying killed beneficial insects like bees, parasitic wasps, and predatory spiders, throwing an already fragile ecosystem into deeper imbalance. Some scientists admitted that attempts to kill the ants had created new ecological gaps, allowing them to spread even faster. After failing with chemicals, research institutes turned to the very strategy that had started the crisis in the first place, introducing new predators. A parasitic fly from South America, Sudacteon curvatus, was imported and released to infect fire ants. The plan sounded perfect. The fly would lay its eggs inside the ants, and the larvae would consume them from the inside out. But the results were limited. The flies affected only a small fraction of the population, and the ants quickly changed their behavior, moving nests frequently and dispersing their numbers to avoid infection. In many regions, the presence of parasitic flies only slowed reproduction without reversing the ant explosion. The federal government launched monitoring programs, mapping fire ant populations with satellite imagery and developing pheromone traps to lure and kill them. Some biotech companies even began exploring genetic self-destruction, editing the ants' DNA so their populations would shrink over time. But all of these efforts remain in experimental stages, and the ethical questions grow larger. Could deeper genetic manipulation of an invasive species repeat the original mistake or create an even bigger one? Each solution stems from the belief that humans can regain control, but every step feels like wading deeper into uncharted waters, and the line between salvation and second mistake has never been thinner. More than half a century has passed since the first fire ants from South America were released onto American soil, with the hope that they would become biological allies. Today, that ally has become a force no one can control. They have crept into every corner of life, from fields to parks, from daycare centers to hospitals, becoming a living reminder that nature never follows human plans. The story of the fire ant is no longer just a lesson about a single insect. It is proof of a deeper paradox. Every time humans try to fix nature, they do more than change it. They change themselves. What began as a solution has quickly turned into a series of larger, more complex, and unpredictable problems. And in their effort to control nature, humans discover they have lost control. Today, fire ants continue to spread with no sign of stopping. New eradication strategies are being developed, new control policies drafted, and billions of dollars continue to pour into an endless war. But the central question remains unanswered. Are we truly solving the problem, or are we simply creating a new chain of even more complex ones? Perhaps the most frightening part of this story isn't the power of the ants. It's the belief that humans can control nature like a machine. And if this story teaches us anything, it's that nature doesn't need us to fix it. It needs us to learn how to live with it, with humility, and with the understanding that there are laws far beyond our comprehension. Do we have the courage to admit our limits? Or will we keep trying to play God until the price we pay goes beyond anything we can imagine? 